Hopefully it doesn't affect all the slides. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, so my name is James McNellis. I'm a developer on the Visual C++ Libraries team, uh, where I maintain our C standard library. Um, and this talk is nothing about that at all. Um, I'm not a Unicode expert by any means, uh, but uh, Scott had sent out a list of uh, possible interesting topics for the tutorial track at, the, at this conference. And uh, he had uh, listed Unicode in C++ on the list. And I said, well, that actually sounds like an interesting topic and a good opportunity to dig in and, and learn a lot about it. Um, so if I say anything that's wrong, and you know it's wrong, please feel free to correct me. But hopefully there shouldn't be too much there. Um, so. This is not going to be an exhaustive coverage of Unicode. You could probably give a whole week-long you know, seminar on you know, all of the details. Um, so we'll stay fairly high level. Uh, we're going to start looking at a bit of history, uh, looking at text encoding in general. Uh, we'll look at the history of Unicode and kind of how we ended up where we are now, and because it kind of helps to explain why a lot of software systems are the way they are. Um, we'll look at uh, the amazing support, or lack thereof, uh, in the C++ standard library for uh, Unicode string processing. Uh, and then we'll look at a couple of libraries uh, that can help with that. So before there was Unicode, since Unicode has only been a standard for about 20-something years, um, Obviously, we were processing text in computers. So how did we do that? And we can start by looking at single byte encodings. Um, if we only have a small number of characters, then we can store one character per byte. So for example, in English, um, the predominant uh, encoding now is ASCII. And it has 32 control characters, and then it has um, 95 printable characters, which are these here, plus the space, which can't be seen. Um, so this is really great if you have English text, because that's all the letters you really need to represent most English, but it's not so great for most other languages. But the way that ASCII works is, you know, you have a string with, you know, a sequence of, of characters, and these are abstract things, you know, it's the letter H and the letter E. Uh, so we're not talking specifically about any font issues or, you know, how it's displayed on the screen. Um, and we map these characters to what, what we'll call code points. And these code points are just numbers. Um, in most cases in the slides, um, I'll, I'll use hexadecimal values, and I won't have the 0x prefix just because it would get very messy very fast. Um, so one advantage of, of ASCII and other single byte character sets is that there's a one-to-one there's a -one mapping between uh, code points and characters. So there weren't 256 characters on that screen that we looked at a minute ago. ASCII is actually only a 7-bit character encoding, so it only requires 7 bits uh, to encode each character. Um, we don't need to... Uh, um, this was used in the past, for example, where you might need a parity bit, or if you had a system with, you know, for example, a 36-bit word, you could fit five characters into a register. Um, but nowadays, generally, we just store them as one character per byte. So. Given that we've got a whole another 127 values that we can store in that byte, uh, we can store, we, we, or 128 values, um, we can use those to represent uh, other characters. And so what ended up happening is uh, people, uh, different groups started extending ASCII. So for example, IBM uh, had code pages for uh, their various systems. Mac OS had, um, you know, an, an eight byte or an eight bit extended ASCII encoding. Um, DEC had one, ISO standardized a number of them. We'll look at one of them, uh, but there's a ton of these. So for example, if you had an IBM PC, the default code page was uh, this code page 437, which had all of those ASCII characters that we looked at before, and also all of these other characters. And these are useful, for example, if you have you know, a limited um, amount of uh, text in other European languages, you can use the, the um, characters with diacritic marks to, to represent that. You know, they had these nice box lines for just uh, you know, drawing different shapes on the screen. Um, and then some various mathematical symbols for you know, if you had a spreadsheet software or, or software that did math kind of things. Um, so this is just one example, though. Like we saw on that slide, there were a whole bunch more. Uh, Mac OS Roman, for example, um, instead of having you know, this set, uh, had, for example, um, the uh, uh, typographically correct punctuation marks you know, that, that sort of slant to the right and left, so you can uh, you know, represent text very nicely. So um, ISO standardized a number of um, extended ASCII character sets uh, in the standard uh, 8859. Um, and um, they based these uh, basically on, characters, on sets of characters that were common on um, you know, typewriter keyboards at the time, or computer keyboards. Um, 
So this standard is, uh, there, there's no further work going into this because of Unicode. Um, they've disbanded the working group. Um, but so, for example, one of the encodings is Latin 1, which lets you encode, you know, again, all of the ASCII characters, plus a bunch of characters, and this is sufficient uh, to represent um, uh, 29 European languages uh, completely. So, you know, this is widely used in, in Western Europe, for example. Um, there's a couple of characters, uh, extra characters that are required for, for example, French, um, and some of that was fixed in a, in a revision of this, uh, the Latin 9 encoding. But, you know, if you're in an Eastern European country, like if you're in Russia and you want to uh, write text, then you might use the Latin Cyrillic encoding, which uh, has, um, you know, the Cyrillic letters. So, you know, if we take a look, this works basically the same way. Um, I believe this says hello in Russian. Um, if it doesn't, then blame Google Translate. Um, so, you know, if we have this string and we want to encode it in the 8859-5 encoding, we'll just take each character and map it to the, its, co its matching code point uh, using the uh, table. And decoding text works the same way. If you have, you know, this sequence of characters, then you can decode it by mapping back to the character uh, to get your string back. We have to be careful because you have to make sure that when you're encoding and decoding, you're using the same character set. So if you encode, for example, this uh, this Russian string uh, using the Latin Cyrillic um, encoding, and then you try and uh, decode it using the Latin Greek encoding, you'll get gibberish. It, it doesn't mean anything. So single byte encodings, like there's a lot of nice, nice features. Each character is the same size. You know, for languages that have only a small number of characters, the text is very compact. Uh, string operations are generally very straightforward. Um, since you know you have a small number of characters and they're really well defined, uh, functions like two upper or you know is digit are really simple to implement and they're really simple to understand. Um, but there's not enough code points to represent all of the characters. Um, not only are there not enough uh, code points to um, represent all of the you know characters in all of the European languages, but like there's some languages that you like there's more than 256 characters. Period. So it makes text interchange difficult because you end up with different encodings and you know, we need another solution anyway for languages with uh, more characters than we can represent. So one solution to this are variable length encodings. Um, these are also sometimes called multi-byte encodings and when we use that, um, we don't mean, for example, um, a, you know, an int may be four bytes, like, so you could say that's a multi-byte object. But when we say multi-byte uh, character set in this context, we mean um, that uh, we may have some code points that are represented with multiple characters. So an example of this is the Shift-JIS encoding. Um, and in this encoding, some characters are representable using a single byte, so it's, it's based largely on ASCII. So you know, if you have an ASCII string, it can be is represented using the same representation uh, in this encoding. Um, but it also has uh, two byte characters consisting of a lead byte and a trail byte. Um, and the lead byte will always have the high bit set, uh, and it's, it's actually a subset of those, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and the trail byte may have any value in this case. So this allows you to represent like a ton of, of characters. Um, so here's kind of a mapping of, of how the character space works. If you're parsing along and, and you come across a character and it has um, one of these uh, yellow uh, code points, then you map it to the ASCII value, or there's two here that are, are slightly different. Um, if it's one of these uh, sort of bluish color boxes, then you map it to that character. Um, and if it's one of the red boxes, it means that it's a lead character. So it's the first character of a two byte, um, um, or I'm sorry, it's the first code unit of a two byte character. So in that case, you map them, you, you read the second byte, um, and you combine the two to, to compute the code point to find out what the character is. Um, so uh, there's one problem with this, or one big problem with this, and that is um, that there's overlap. So for example, uh, here are the encodings for uh, you know, three letters. Um, it includes both Latin and Cyrillic letters. So uh, the letter D, of course, is, is encoded as, as uh, the hexadecimal value 44, uh, which is the same as ASCII. Um, to represent this, uh, this Cyrillic letter, um, it starts with, with an 84 byte, and then the next byte will be a 44. And then uh, to represent this other Cyrillic letter, it'll start with an 84, and then the next byte will also be an 84. So when you're decoding a sequence, you know, we come across a 44 and we map it to D, and then we come across another 44 and we map it to D. We come across an 84, we know that that's a lead byte, um, so we combine it with the next character to form the next, um, uh, the next code point. But there's a problem with this, and it's, it's a problem with overlap. 
So if you have a pointer into a sequence and it's just pointing at some character and you want to know, you know, is this the beginning of a character or what's the previous character before this, um, you have to actually walk all the way back until you can find a synchronization point. You have to find, um, you know, you have to f go backtrack to figure out whether this is a lead byte or a trail byte. Um, so this sort of encoding is, is um, uh, it, it lacks a property called self-synchronization, where basically um, when, you're, when you're in the string somewhere, you want to be able to tell, you know, where, where does the next character begin, where does the previous character begin. So you need to maintain complex state to keep track of where you are. Um, so this is just one technique. Uh, there's another technique, uh, for example, uh, ISO IEC 2022, which uh, is a sort of a general standard for different encodings. Um, it, uh, it uses escape sequences, so like you'll see an escape character, and then uh, from that point forward, you'll be using a different character set, and then it uses another escape character to switch back. Um, so these are even more complex because you know not only do, do you have to walk back to you know find the synchronization point for the previous character, but you have no idea what character en encoding you're using without going all the way back to the beginning of the string and walking forward to, to find out what encoding you're supposed to be using. So on the bright side, there's a, suspan a substantially expanded code space. You can represent you know, up to a few over 32,000 uh, characters, though you know, generally like in the shift GIS encoding, you know, it was fewer because of the way the encoding was designed. Um, some byte-oriented string operations, so str copy will still work to copy a full string if you need, uh, or operations that do something similar. Uh, but there's a bunch of disadvantages. It's complex to parse. Um, yeah, some common operations, like we saw, uh, require a linear scan over the string. Um, many string operations uh, become difficult. Uh, so this does not map well to um, many of the existing C APIs that we have. So for example, you know, if you want to know if a character is an alphabetic character, you can't call is alpha because the type that it takes is a, is a single care. Um, and we still have the problem that there's many different encoding standards. Um, so there's, you know, we have the interchange problem. You have to know what the encoding of the text is when you go and, and read it into your process. So let's take a look at uh, what, uh, what was done in Unicode 1 um, to try and solve this. So 256 characters aren't enough, and multi-byte encodings are kind of a pain to work with. Um, so how about we use uh, 16 bits per character? So the, Uni the Unicode uh, started off with three design goals. Um, it's designed to be universal, so they want, uh, they want to be able to represent all characters that are likely to be used in text interchange. Um, they want to be efficient, so it should be easy to parse plain text. So we don't want any of those, any of those escape sequence type encodings or, or um, uh, multi-byte encodings that require you to backtrack to figure out uh, what the character is that you're looking at. Um, and they want it to be unambiguous. So once you know, a code point is assigned to a character, once they say this number represents this character, that won't change, and it always means exactly that. Um, finally, it's important to note that um, Unicode is just a set of characters. They're abstract characters, so they're not glyphs. So, for example, there's many different fonts, um, you know, and you know, different fonts have different representations of characters, and that's totally fine. Um, Unicode is not concerned with the visual representation. Um, so, in Unicode 1.0, um, there's a 16-bit code point. Each character is mapped to a 16-bit code point. Um, so, in theory, you can represent up to 65,536 characters. Um, all of the characters in the Latin 1 uh, code set that we saw before uh, map to the same code point. So this is useful for um, you know, interchange with ASCII data since ASCII is, is a predominant uh, character encoding because you can just take, you know, for example, the um, uh, code point 44 and just expand it to 16 bits and you still have the, the, letter, the capital letter D. Um, and this, this encoding that came with Unicode 1.0 is called UCS2. Um, and so each code point is mapped to a single 16-bit code unit. The 2 is because it's 2 bytes. So we can see here, if we have that same string hello again, we map it to you know, code points uh, representing each letter. Uh, for Unicode, the U plus just means this is the code point with this value. And you'll note that for this particular string, you know, the, the actual values of those code points are the same as, as in ASCII and in Latin 1. But again, the advantage of Unicode 1.0 is that, you know, you can represent characters from all sorts of different languages or different scripts, um, and even, you know, scripts that, uh, you know, aren't really scripts. So, you know, here we have a Latin character, a Greek character, a Cyrillic character, Japanese, Mongolian, I guess the uh, snow people, and uh, uh, Arabic. So. Uh, UCS2 decoding um, basically works the same as it did in um, 
uh, with the single byte character sets. You take, you know, we're reading along, we find, we take the next two bytes, we say, ah, it's a 48, and we map it to H, and so on and so forth through the string. Does anybody see a problem with this? Endian. Yes. So this here, we've assumed that the data is in a big endian format. And if, in fact, it was stored in a little endian format, or if, uh, or, um, Rather, if we read it in in a, in a little Indian format, if we're on a little Indian architecture that we're reading this in on, um, we'll get gibberish, again, translating the text out. Um, so the solution to this was to add what's called a byte order mark. And the byte order mark gets written at the beginning of text, um, and they use this special character, F-E-F-F. -F. Um, it's just a code point like any other. But it allows you to detect uh, whether uh, the data is in little Indian or big Indian ordering. Um, so in this case, uh, it, it tells us that we're in big endian ordering. And then if we switch it, and we switch all the bytes to, to little endian, then it's easy to see um, that change in the byte ordering mark. So UCS2 uh, you know, has a number of advantages. There's a huge number of characters that are representable. I mean, 65,000 characters has got to be you know, enough, right? Um, characters from different scripts are easily combinable uh, into a single string. Um, and each code point is representable using a single code unit, so we don't have any of those multi-byte uh, encoding problems. You know, it's much easier to, to work with the text. Uh, but you know, there's some there's some substantial disadvantages. You know, there's multiple possible byte orderings. Um, every character requires two bytes. So, for example, if you're moving from one of the the um, ISO encodings that we looked at before to this, um, your text is going to be twice as large. Um, and finally, none of the byte-oriented string functions work with UCS2 strings. So you know you can't you know use str copy to copy one of these, uh, because as we saw, the uh, the terminator for the string is two bytes long. It's it's two zero bytes. James? Yeah. Uh, question: uh, This F E F E E whatever F F E F E was it supposed to go at the beginning of each stream, or is it like only for file encoding of the? So usually, usually it goes into the file or you know whatever is being used for interchange with other systems. Uh, once you have you know the string in your your software, it's kind of assumed that you'll you know you're you're using a consistent character encoding or you're keeping track of it otherwise. But for example, when you're writing a file, you want to make sure that you write the byte order mark. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The question was um, whether the uh, the byte order mark goes at the beginning of every string or just at the beginning of every file. Um, it goes at the beginning of uh, of the file. Um, or whatever unit you're using for transferring data. So you know, if you're sending data across a socket, you'd send it before you send any Unicode text. Um, the Unicode specification says that if it's not, if there's no byte order mark, you should assume that it's uh, um, big endian. Uh, though on some systems that may not make sense. So for example, Windows uses little endian uh, by default. So in Unicode one. Um, this was the usage of the code space. So you can kind of see this is a representation of, of the 65,000 some odd <coughs> values. Um, that you know, at the beginning we have the general scripts, which are you know most of the uh, characters needed for Euro uh, European language uh, scripts. Um, we have some symbols. Uh, there's a huge block for the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean ideographs. Um, but then there's this big block of unused characters. So this should be plenty of room. And in fact. From the Unicode specification, 1.0 specification, it says, with over 30,000 unallocated character positions, the Unicode character encoding provides sufficient space for the foreseeable future expansion. So this is a graph. And the blue line is the, the growth of the number of characters in Unicode, uh, in each of the versions of the Unicode standard. And the red line is, um, th shows the growth of the number of, of distinct values we can represent <laughs> using a 16-bit integer. Uh, and you'll see that the 16-bit integers are not keeping up. We're, uh, so clearly, that 16-bit encoding, that nice, happy land where we had where every character was uh, representable using a single code point, um, isn't going to work. So everything changed in Unicode uh, 2.0, and it's changed gradually over time to you know address various issues in, in encodings. Um, but we'll kind of skip over some of the details of history, and now we'll just look at uh, you know where we're at today. What do the Unicode encodings look like um, today? So it turns out we needed to be able to encode you know more than 65,000 characters. Um, if I recall correctly, there's 70 something thousand uh, ideographs in the current Unicode standard today. So you, just for those, we need more than 65,000 characters. Um, so in Unicode 2.0, the code space was expanded uh, to uh, about 1.1 million uh, characters. And there's a reason for that number that we'll see in a little bit. Um, but since the 16-bit uh, 
is, is not enough to represent a full code unit. How about the next logical number, 32 bits? So UTF-32 works just, uh, just like UTF-16 did in that there's, you know, except that we now have 32 bits per code, uh, per code unit to represent each of the, uh, each of the characters. Um, I've had to shorten my string from hello to hi because otherwise, you know, I'd run out of memory and on the slide and, uh, so obviously this encoding also has, you know, the same problem as before that you need a byte order mark. Yes? You kind of jump from UCS to UTF. Can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah, so the, uh, uh, the question was, what's the difference between um, the UCS and UTF? Uh, so UCS uh, stands for Universal Character Set, um, and it, it comes from uh, an ISO standard that's closely related to, to Unicode. Um, and so the UCS2 just means it's a, it's a, it was a two-byte encoding. Uh, for UTF, it's the, the uh, Unicode uh, transformation format, um, and it's just another acronym. Um, and with UTF, the number is the number of bits, not the number of bytes. So again, it requires a byte order mark. So you know, here we have the, the um, big endian string, and we can also represent little endian strings. Um, so most importantly, though, we can encode, you know, non, uh, we can uh, encode characters that are larger than 0x FFFF. So here we have a little rabbit with a floppy ear or something. Um, and so when, we ex when the code space was expanded, um, basically all of the characters that were already, or that code space that was part of Unicode already, the first 65,000 some odd characters, uh, is what's called the, the, the basic multilingual plane. And the idea is, is that all of the commonly used characters are there, and we'll see why in a moment. Um, and then all, you know, there were um, 17 other planes, uh, 16 or 17 other planes uh, beyond that uh, that store, you know, supplementary characters. Most of those are not used uh, today yet, um, but they're, you know, available for future expansion of the character set. So, you know, there's a number of advantages to UTF-32. Uh, again, now we can represent an even huger number of characters. Um, every, every, every code point is still representable using a single code unit, and we'll see the distinction between those in a moment. Um, though this isn't uh, all that useful uh, in most practical string usage, and we'll see why um, much later in this talk. Uh, but there's a bunch of disadvantages here. You know, you still need two, you still have two possible byte orderings, so you need the, the byte order mark. Um, every character requires four bytes, and as we saw, we've only expanded the code space to support, uh, you know, about 1.1 million characters, uh, which means that uh, we're wasting at least 11 bits uh, out of every one of those 32-bit units. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's by no definition dense. Um, it wastes a lot of space. Um, none of the byte-oriented string functions work, just like with UCS2. Uh, and most importantly, nothing that was written to use the UCS2 um, Encoding works with UTF-32 because the, the uh, code units are of a different size. So because we don't want to, you know, waste all this space, we don't want to be sending all of these, you know, extra by, um, bits when we don't need them, um, a second character encoding uh, called UTF-8 uh, was created. So the 8 here means that each code unit is one byte. Um, because uh, we sometimes need multiple uh, code units to represent a code point, um, this is a, a, um, a variable with encoding. And so the way it works is that if you've got a character, you know, between 0 and, and 7f, um, we'll just encode it in, the, in, uh, in a single byte, and the, the high order bit will be uh, 0. Um, one nice feature about this is that this means that every ASCII string, because Unicode started, uh, all of the ASCII characters have, their sa have the same code point value in um, uh, Unicode as they did in ASCII, um, any ASCII string is also a, a UTF-8 string. Um, so if we have more characters than that, though, um, we encode it using special bit patterns. Uh, so if the high-order bit is set, um, we know that, okay, this is part of a multi-character um, or a, a multi-code unit um, character, and so and the, the number of bits that are set tell us how many additional uh, code units we have to look at. So you can see here, um, there's one one here, and so we know that there's one additional element. There's two here, there's three here, and so we know that there's, there's uh, how many elements are. So again, there's the nice thing that, you know, converting from ASCII, we simply expand, you know, to the, the Unicode code unit, and they have the same representation. Yes? Could you go back one yes. slide? Yes. So, I think I, have a, I think I didn't catch on to what you were saying. We'll take a I have another slide, and I've highlighted pieces of it. Um, yes. Um, 
But of course, again, just like with, with UCS2, we can represent other scripts and we can represent characters that were not representable using UCS2, like, again, the rabbit. Um, so if we look at that table again, it's this first bit sequence here that tells you how many characters are in, or how many, sorry, the bit sequence, uh, or the, the high order bits of the, um, the lead character tells you how many, ta uh, how many trail characters there are to read. Does that make sense? Um, so a nice feature of this that we didn't see with the other, uh, with the previous uh, variable width encodings we looked at is that if you're pointing at a character, um, you know whether you're looking at a trail, a trail byte or a lead byte um, because all of the trail bytes start with one zero and there are no lead bytes that start with, with the one zero bit pattern. Um, secondly, if you're pointing at, you know, one trail byte, you only have to walk back, you know, until you find a lead byte and you know, okay, this is the beginning of the character and this is how many characters I need to skip to the next one. Um, so walking both forwards and backwards in the string is relatively efficient as long as you're going one, char uh, one character at a time. So there's a number of advantages with UTF-8. Um, ASCII text has the same representation in, UT uh, in UTF-8. Uh, there's no byte order mark because, again, the code unit is a single byte, so there's one canonical ordering of, of uh, text units. Yes, Sean? I just wanted to put one more advantage there, which is that uh, UTF-8, uh, because of the way the encoding is designed, if you uh, uh, sort UTF-8 strings yes. graphically, it sorts the same way as UTF-8. Yes, so um, Sean's point was that um, given the encoding, it turns out that if you sort these bytes lexicographically, so if you sort them, you know, is this byte greater than this byte, and then move on to the next one, and so on, um, the ordering you get is the same ordering that you would get in UTF-32, and it's, it's the code point ordering, so you get your, char your characters or your strings out in, in uh, order based on code point. Um, so you don't need a byte order mark, um, however, uh, it, is permiss it is permitted to put one in. Specific specifically, this is used in order to identify uh, UTF-8 text uh, in places where it might be um, uh, ambiguous with other uh, t uh, character encodings. And so its byte order mark is uh, the, the sequence of bytes EF, BB, BF. Um, and it turns out that that, um, that that sequence of bytes is actually, if you take the, the byte order um, code point, um, uh, FFEF, uh, and encode it using the Unicode, uh, uh, the UTF-8 rules that we just looked at, then that's the byte sequence you would get. Um, so many byte-oriented string functions still work with this. So, you know, str copy, str cat, str len, these, these kinds of things still work um, with these strings because, again, their, their code unit is a single, is a single byte. Um, Disadvantages, though, it's a variable width encoding, so if you want to know how many characters are in, this, uh, are in the um, string, you need to actually walk linearly from the beginning to the end to count them. Um, and there's text for a few languages that requires more storage than in a 16-bit encoding, and I have a list of those. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned that the byte-oriented string functions still work because there are single byte code units, but really it's because there's no embedded zero code units. Um, Sure. So uh, the 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 point was that um, the uh, the byte oriented string functions like str copy, for example, uh, works not only because there's um, um, because we have a, a basic uh, co code unit of care of type of a single byte, uh, but it also works because there's no in uh, embedded nulls. Um, so. That's true, but in, um, so even in, in UTF-16 or in uh, UTF-32, for example, um, the code unit is, is four bytes. Um, so if you ever come across a four byte code unit that is all zeros, then you know that's, that's your null terminator. So it's, it's, you know, yes, it's just another feature of the encoding, I suppose. Yes? So this last disadvantage that you list here, uh, do you mean to say that UTF-8 can't encode all of UTF-32? Uh, no, what I mean is that uh, text for a few languages requires more storage. Uh, I'm sorry, so the question was, um, can, does this mean that um, UTF-8 cannot encode all of UTF-32? Uh, no, so all, all three of the encodings that we're going to look at, uh, UTF-32, UTF-8, and then UTF-16 in a moment, uh, can encode the entire uh, code space of, of 1.1 million characters. Um, it's just the opposite of the last advantage. Hmm? It's just the opposite of the last advantage. In the first case, you're saying... Yes, right. Really Yes. Like one of the disadvantages, sometimes it's not. Right. right. So usually, it requ uh, usually the 8-bit encoding requires less storage, but there are a handful of languages where, the, where a 16-bit encoding would be more efficient. So, yes. Um, I'd like to characterize UTF-8 as a brilliant 
brilliant, brilliant piece. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. If you don't, so for people who don't know, it was done by Ken Thompson. Well, but I by he was building on previous encodings that had many of those features. I mean, it wasn't a single person, really. Yes. So the point was, uh, Beam pointed out that yes, this is a, a brilliant encoding. Uh, Sean pointed out that uh, Ken Thompson uh, developed it. I did not know that. That's an interesting fact. Yes. <laughs> okay. First, it requires more uh, storage for Chinese. Yep. So we're actually going to take a look at that. I've got a couple examples. Another thing is, is it works with usual uh, uh, single byte based string operations, but um, it, ha it has a significant disadvantage on backward compatibility because most of the legacy multi byte encodings works on two bytes. and UTF-8 usually gives three bytes on those languages. And right. the difference between two and three is a lot different between two and four. Right. Um, so the point uh, that was just made is that um, there are some languages, uh, specifically a number of Asian languages, and I have a list, where um, uh, you can use a 16-bit encoding, like the one we'll look at in a moment, and generally each character only requires two bytes, 16 bits. Um, but then uh, with UTF-8, those same characters require three bytes to represent due to the encoding scheme. Um, I actually think that this is uh, not particularly an issue, and I'll explain why uh, in a couple slides. So we have this problem, though, that, you know, so UCS2 is obsolete. It can't encode all the code points. Nobody should ever do anything with UCS2 ever again. Um, but there's a lot of large systems and libraries uh, that were built using the 16-bit UCS and UCS2 encoding because, you know, at the time, especially in the early 90s, you know, that was that was Unicode. That was good enough, as we saw. Everybody, yeah, the Unicode standard even said this is plenty of code points to represent everything. Um, so a number of big examples that uh, people here are probably likely to run into. Uh, Qt uh, development of Qt started in uh, in 1992. Uh, Windows NT development started in the late 80s, but the first release came out in 1993, and so it uses a 16-bit um, uh, code unit. Um, and then Java, which uh, came out in 1995. Um, so because of these and, and, and a large number of other libraries and systems, um, you know, the 16-bit the encodings have sort of propagated to other places. So many C++ Unicode libraries use a 16-bit code unit. Um, the .NET framework um, uses a 16-bit code unit for interop with Windows largely. Um, so we need something in modern Unicode that allows us to work with a 16-bit code unit and that is largely backwards compatible with UCS2. And so the solution for that is UTF-16. And there's a couple things about this. So for code points uh, between 0 and you know, the maximum uh, value representable uh, by uh, 2 bytes, um, UTF-16 is equivalent to UCS-2. So if you, took, if you take UCS-2 text and you try and interpret it as UTF-16, that'll work fine. Um, also important is that these are the most important, the most commonly used code points. So you know the the most certainly all uh, most of the code points used in uh, in European languages, uh, almost all of the code points uh, used in um, in Asian languages are in this first uh, this first chunk, and so it's called the bulti the basic multilingual plane. Um, so as we saw uh, in the in the chart showing the the code point usage in UCS2, there was a whole block toward the end that was that was not assigned yet, and so in order to encode um, non, uh, you know, characters outside of this 0 to, to 65,000 and some odd range. Um, 2,048 code points uh, between uh, D800 and DFFF uh, are reserved for s specifically for use um, in encoding UTF-16. So this is 11 bits uh, of, um, of space. And so that is enough, um, as we'll see in a moment, to represent um, all 1 million uh, values. And we'll do that using what are called surrogate pairs. So how do we, how do, we do this encoding? So if we have a code point, and it's between uh, these two values, first we subtract um, the uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 from it uh, to give us a 20-bit number um, between 0 and, and the maximum value represented by 20 bits. We split this in half with the upper 10 bits and the lower 10 bits. Um, and then we'll add the upper 10 bits to 0xd800 and we'll form what are, what's called the lead surrogate. And then we'll take the lower 10 bits and we'll add them to this, this other number, dc00, uh, and we'll form the tail surrogate. So I have an example of this. Um, there's a uh, symbol, the cocktail glass, 
um, that is not representable using um, only uh, uh, 16 bits. Um, so I'll call this a surrogatini uh, since we're going to use surrogate pairs. So what we do is we subtract um, uh, we subtract from it to get a, a value uh, that's representable by 20 bits. And then we'll take that, I've converted it to binary because it's easier to see. We'll take the bottom 10 bits and the top 10 bits, and the top 10 bits we will encode into the lead surrogate, and the bottom 10 bits we will encode into the, uh, uh, the trail surrogate. And so those are formed just using the same steps that we had before. So there's a couple of advantages to UTF-16. The most notable one is that we get some level of compatibility with UCS-2, um, which is important for a lot of systems. Um, there, there are a few languages, and again, I have the list in a moment, where text uh, is smaller in UTF-16 than in UTF-8 in terms of the number of bytes uh, required to represent it. But there's a lot of disadvantages here. Uh, there's multiple possible byte orderings, so you still need the, the byte order mark, just like in UCS-2. Um, every character requires at least two bytes. Um, none of the byte-oriented string functions, like str copy, again, work with UTF-16 strings, just like they didn't with UCS-2. Um, it's a variable width encoding, so we have you know, most of the disadvantages of UTF-8. Um, and because it's larger than, uh, since the code unit is larger than UTF-8, we have practically none of the benefits. Um, and the last point uh, is the point that Sean made a moment ago, um, is that uh, binar uh, binary string comparison, so if you do a lexical graphic uh, string comparison of, of UTF-16 strings, it produces a different ordering than for UTF-8 and UTF-32. So, yep. If you go back to three slides. Yep. Uh, three slides. Three slides. One more? Yeah. This one. Oh, no, sorry. Ah. One more. No. Oh, other direction? OK. Yes. So you claim that for code points between 0, 0, 0, 0 up to FF, 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 UTF 16 is equivalent to UCS 2. But how could that be the case if we reserve? Ah. Uh, 2,000 code points out of those. Yep. So um, there are no characters assigned to these code points. Um, so the idea is, is that uh, these code points will never be used in, in text interchange ever. Like they're, they're reserved absolutely for use solely in, in composing surrogate pairs. So if you're decoding UTF-8, you should never ever come across these. Um, if you're decoding UTF-32, again, you should never come across these. Uh, the question was, um, how do... How do um, how is this second statement here true that uh, for code points uh, between 0000 and FFFF uh, representable um, using a single code unit when we reserve code points? So. But does that mean that in UCS2 you don't use those? Yes, so they, so they were unassigned in UCS2. They've never been used for a, um, an actual uh, character. All right, so. UTF-16, again, has a lot of the disadvantages. Um, um, so UTF-8, uh, it's more compact than UTF-32 in all possible cases. Um, it's a variable width encoding, so it's more complex. Uh, but it's by far the most commonly used for storage and data transmission, and it's the dominant character encoding on the internet. Um, so I found a study online that found that out of the top 10,000 websites, 78% 78, 78 of them used uh, UTF-8, and, and it was 65% out of the top million websites. Um, and many of the others were using uh, either specific uh, um, encodings for, for different regions or, or other things like that. Um, UTF-32 has the benefits that it's, it's simple, so it, it's a fixed width encoding, uh, but it has a lot of wasted space because of the large 32-bit code units. Um, I would contend that if, um, if Unicode 1.0 had not introduced UCS-2, uh, then UTF-16 uh, probably would not exist at all, and that its primary purpose is to uh, support interop with, um, with uh, or that the primary purpose of UTF-16 is support interop with, with UCS-2 uh, old code. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a number of languages where it takes, uh, where if you encode a string using UTF-8, it takes more space than using UTF-16. And this is an analysis that uh, a colleague at Microsoft did. They found a, there's a, a corpus online, and there's a link in the, in the slide notes if you're interested, uh, that has 160 something megabytes of text in a whole bunch of different languages. Uh, and he encoded it using the two different encodings to see you know, which languages, you know, what the space usage is for different languages. And so you can see that at the high end, Japanese text um, on average may require 150% you know, of the space 
uh, when encoded in UTF-8 compared to UTF-16. Um, so these are the only languages where it's um, where UTF-8 may be less compact. Um, there's about a uh, you know a hundred and something other languages that are all more compact in UTF-8. Now, granted, some of these languages uh, like Chinese and Japanese are used by an awful lot of people, um, but. The important, but an important thing to note is, is that this is very dense text, right? So this is just plain, you know, plain text for these languages, um, and that's often not how text, you know, appears. Uh, usually, for example, if you download a web page, an awful lot of the, you know, the, the characters in that are going to be angle brackets and, and ASCII characters for, you know, encoding HTML tags and things like that. And so, in practice, uh, it turns out that the overhead is it's generally much less than, you know, 50% overhead. Yeah. So you were saying, maybe I didn't understand your point, that you, um, UTF-16 is just a holdover because of um, UCS-2. Y yes. But there's this distinct advantage with... Sort of. My, my, so, yes, so if you are, you know, if you have a large, you know, a large body of, of Japanese text and you want, you know, you want to store that. Uh, oh, so the question was, you know, there are distinct advantages in some languages for um, UTF-16. Um, so there's a couple points. Um, so, first off, like, I, I think that the issue is generally not, you know, this severe because, again, you know, usually you'll have, you know, other data mixed in that's not in that language. Um, the second case is, um, oftentimes, if you are concerned about space, like storage space on disk or, or, or transmission space across the network, um, you'll, you'll use some kind of, of compression for that. And generally, both uh, the UTF-8 uh, string and the UTF-16 string will compress roughly the same. Uh, there may be you know, a, few, a few percentage difference, but it's not substantial. Um, so, yes, I would argue that given the, the complexity of the UTF-16 encoding and given you know, that you know, UTF-32 can be used when you need, you know, a one-to-one -one mapping between character uh, code points and code units, and UTF-8 can be used for practically everything else. Um, that the UTF-16 is largely for, for interop, I would say. So we'll look at one more uh, feature of Unicode before we start digging into C++, and that's dynamic composition. So here we have uh, the letter A, which is very simple. I think we we're all familiar with it. Um, but oftentimes, it's not just the letter A. It may have you know, various diacritic marks. And Unicode basically uh, handles this by having, um, basically, you have the set of base, what are called base characters. So the letter A is a base character, and all the other letters and, and other characters that can appear on their own are base characters. And then each of the diacritic marks is what's called a combining character. So for example, to represent that, we would represent it using two Unicode characters. Um, 41 for A and then 308 for the, um, the diuresis um, and to combine together to form this, this single text element of the A with diuresis. Um, so in general, when you're processing text, you cannot assume, like even if you have UTF-32, you know, as you're reading across the text, you can't assume, okay, I've read you know, 32 bits, that's my next you know, character, I can just display that on its own. There may be combining characters after it. Um, this is an example you know, with uh, that is common in many European languages. Uh, this technique is also used, uh, for example, in uh, Hangul symbols uh, in the Korean language uh, to compose syllables into, into, um, into words. Um, so you can combine lots of things. Like You're not limited to one combining character. So for example, here we have the letter E, and we've combined it with uh, a combining bridge below, a combining tilde, and a combining X above. Um, the order of, these, uh, of the combining marks sometimes matter. So for example here, you can see that the, the combining character for the tilde comes before the x, and so the tilde is grouped closer to the e. Whereas in this case, where we've swapped the order, the x appears closer to the e, and the tilde appears above it because of the order of those. However, in all of these, the combining bridge below, the last one uh, in both of these examples, you can put that anywhere because it's, it's, it applies to a different location on the character. Um, so there's a number of, of problems that this causes. So not only you know, can you not just you know, parse text you know, one code point at a time, but also if you want to compare strings for equality, like as we'll see in a little bit, it becomes difficult because these two, the, um, not these two strings, uh, but you know, if we had moved, uh, if we move the combining bridge forward, then that should compare equal to the string with the combining bridge that's later. So let's, that's enough about Unicode in theory. Let's look at the amazing Unicode support in C++. So C++11 adds a number of uh, Unicode code unit types. 
Um, CARE, of course, has always existed, and it can be used to represent a UTF-8 code unit. Um, UTF-16 can be represented, uh, code units can be represented using a, a CARE-16T, and UTF-32 with a, with a CARE-32T. Um, the use of, uh, yes? Something that has annoyed me since C++11 came out is that UTF-8 is CARE. Yes. yes. Instead of unsigned care, because we need all eight bits and we do mostly do ma bit manipulation. Care may be unsigned, or it may not be. It may, yes. may not be. Like, that's <laughs> not what we need. Yes, so the reason for that, and we'll, we'll look at that, is largely for interop with, with stood string. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I asked the uh, call people for this question, and they say if the char uh, cannot represent all 256. Uh, possibilities, then this implementation is not UTF-8 friendly. So, um, I think that. So I know that I, I don't. I, I don't actually. It requires it. Hmm? Yeah, yeah I, I know that at least POSIX requires at least an 8-bit care. I don't remember if POSIX requires an exactly 8-bit care or if it just requ uh, or if C++ requires at least and then POSIX requires exactly. Um, but um, so in practice, anything that um, I'm talking about here, when I say byte, I mean octet. I mean 8 bits. Um, yes, there are you know embedded systems and other things that have other w other widths of, of bytes. Um, but in practice, uh, when we're doing lots of text processing, I think that we're generally working on systems that have an 8-bit. Uh, Byte. So, in addition to having these code unit types, we also have you can have Unicode string literals. Um, so these have new prefixes. You know, it used to be that you could have a an, a no prefix or an L prefix for W care T. Um, so now there is a U8 prefix, which means this is a a, a, um, a Unicode a UTF-8 Unicode string literal. There's a lowercase U, which means that it's a, a care six a 16-bit UTF-16 string literal. And then there's a capital U, which means it's a it's a 32-bit um, UTF-32 string literal. Um, and you can, so you can represent Unicode characters that are outside of you know the the normal set of English characters either using uh, universal character names with the backslash U and then the the code point number, um, or using you know if your compiler supports it you can actually just put the the characters into your text. Um, so there's also you know we can also use these as character literals, sort of. Because remember that some characters are not represented using a single code unit in each of these encodings. So, for example, um, you know, with uh, with the uh, the narrow literals for for UTF-8, there's no extra prefix because all of the things that you can represent using you know a single um, a single care are you know what you can represent in a single code unit. So, for example, if we try to represent you know the snowman using a, a, a UTF-8 care literal, that's not going to work because it's not going to fit. Um, similarly, f similarly for our cocktail glass, which you know requires um, which requires 32 bits. Um, the same is true for care 16T. If you want to represent something that's not representable by 16 bits, that won't work. Um, so it's only care 32T that can represent a full any full character. Um, when the, uh, specifically here for care 16 t I say it's wrong. I actually believe that it's ill-formed uh, from reading the standard, but uh, G++ was happy to compile it uh, as is, so I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Visual C++ does not yet support uh, the Unicode character literals. So C++ has this amazing Unicode string type. I'm just kidding. It does not. <laughs> um, so what you can do, though, is... Um, you can use std basic string, um, and you can specialize it with you know, string u16 string and u32 string um, for each of these code unit types, and we can initialize them from you know the the various Unicode character literals. But when we look at this, you know we have to be careful because std string just stores a dumb it's just a dumb sequence of code units. It does not store code points. It does not store characters, you know text elements, graphene clusters, you know any of these higher level things. Um, so, you know, if you have iterators, if you start, you know, if you iterate from begin to end, then you're going to be iterating over code units. So you can't say, okay, this is, you know, a character, this is another character, this is another character. Um, size does not return the number of code points, it returns the number of code units. Uh, functions like front, back, operator, uh, the subscript operator, uh, and other things, they operate on code units as well. Which makes, for example, if you have UTF-8 text in a, in a std string, uh, it makes it rather inconvenient. You know, if you want to... Um, 
as I have an example here, um, you know, if you want to push back a snowman and, and say hello to it, um, you can't just call pushback. Uh, you actually have to have the snowman in, you know, a UTF-8 string and then copy all the elements into the back. Um, we also could have constructed a std string and used plus equal or done, you know, any number of other ways to do that. Um, but the key here is, is that you know, it's, it's difficult to work with text, you know, in terms of characters. And so if, if you take nothing away from this talk, then note that, you know, if you're working with Unicode uh, strings, stop thinking about characters and think about, you know, substrings and, and you know, longer sequences of text than just characters. Um, so we have the same problem with, with the, UC, with the, the uh, U16 string, and it's only with the, um, the U32 string that you can actually push back any character because each character is representable using a single code unit. So we can look at um, a property of, of Unicode strings. We can look at length and what do we mean by string length. So if we have you know, a simple ASCII string, the, the string length is, is actually straightforward. You just start from the beginning and it's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, it's five characters. But it's not quite so simple in Unicode. So I have here this string and here is its uh, Unicode representation. So it's um, the digit one, the letter A, the, the, the diaries, and then um, the cocktail glass. So, and here's how it's represented in um, in the three Unicode uh, encodings. So, first we can think of a string as being okay. It's just you know how many bytes are in it. In that case, um, here I've just used alternating colors to show it's one, two, three. Um, so, you know, in that case, we can just count the number of bytes. That's fairly straightforward. Um, we can, secondly, we can think about it as the number of code units. And if you call dot size on, you know, a, on a std basic string, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get you know, the number of uh, elements that it takes to store this. Um, we can think of it as the number of code points, right? So for example, um, for the cocktail glass, you know, it may have taken four bytes and it took two code units, but it's still just one code point because it's one, a single character. Yes? Yes, and we're going to take a look at that in a moment. So there, there is another representation, and that's going to cause us even more trouble. <laughs> um, and finally, we can, you know, we, can, we can look at this as you know, the number of text elements, the number of things that we should consider as being you know, one you know, whole unit of, of text. And so in this case, you know, we combine the A and the, and the diaries together, and you know, it's, it's one text unit that we want to treat together. So you know, we have these these different meanings of string length and you know if you're using a, a std string or something like that you know you're going to be um, size is going to return to you the number of code units not the number of characters so string equality so for again for ASCII strings this is very straightforward to think about you know if you want to know if two strings are equal and you know you can use strcomp or or, uh, or other functions or the equals equals on std string, um, you're just going to walk uh, you know and compare the representations and look at the first character and the second character and the third character uh, and and see and stop when they're not equal. Um, and if you have Unicode strings, uh, it's the exact same thing. You know you can get a representational equality uh, by walking by starting from the beginning and and you know comparing each of the code units. But in Unicode, there's multiple representations of some uh, characters, or some things, I should say. So for example, here we have the, the A with diaries. There's, you know, we, we saw it represented as two different Unicode characters. But there's also a composed form of this, which is the A with diaries. And so anytime that you see, you know, these two characters together in a Unicode string, they should compare equal, or they should be considered equivalent um, to this single Unicode character. Um, the reason for these pre for some of these precomposed forms like this one, like it's kind of silly. Why do we have you know both you know this precomposed form and this other decomposed form? Um, is largely for uh, uh, compatibility with with some other uh, with existing character encoding. So for example, the um, the Latin one character encoding had a whole bunch of characters that had um, uh, diacritic marks on them, and uh, the Unicode committee wanted to make sure that you could take uh, text encoded in you know, pretty much any character encoding, convert it to Unicode, and then convert it back and get the same string. And so in order to do that, um, they need to, you know, have two different, they need to have this precomposed form. But it's not just limited to diacritic marks. 
So as an example, there are actually two letter A's in Unicode. There's the normal one that we get from ASCII, and then there's uh, a full width capital letter A uh, that is used, um, or um, that corresponds to, again, for ca compatibility with, with uh, older character encodings. Um, there are some uh, uh, Asian character encodings that have what's called a full width Latin capital letter A, so it takes up you know twice the normal space in a fixed width font, uh, so that if you want to line it up in columns with uh, Asian you know characters from Asian scripts that are very wide, you know you can actually do that and, and things line up well. There's also ligatures, so for example, um, the F and the I it may be represented by you know an F followed by a letter I, or there's a Latin small ligature FI that's used in typography a lot. Um, it may not just be two characters. Uh, the Latin there is there are uh, some ro Roman numeral characters, uh, and then finally we mentioned this previously before that um, if you have a character with with multiple uh, combining char uh, with multiple um, combining characters like this, um, as long as they don't conflict, as long as they you know they affect different parts of the letter, um, you can change their order in the text sequence and they should compare equivalent. Yes. Previous slide. Uh, yeah. Just curious, what's the motivation of putting that in, into Unicode? Was there an actual use, or is it just some random encoding already had it, and Unicode tries to be all inclusive in that regard? Yes. So the question was, why include you know a character like this at all? I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah. Or the martini glass. Or <laughs> yes. Well, I use those all the time. All the Maja and tiles and domino tiles Unicode. Unicode has all the Maja and tiles in it. Ah. And all the and all the dominoes. Yes. Can, can you repeat? Uh, so Unicode has all of the, uh, for example, the Mahjong tiles, and uh, I know it has uh, all the chess symbols. Uh, so, for example, for chess notations, um, yeah, there, there's there's whole collections of, of characters. But for example, why there's a Unicode snowman, I, I don't, you know, I, I I don't see that a lot in text when I'm, you know, reading so things. A lot of these come from their cell phone companies that got this standardized for their uh, formats for text messaging. And so it's a standard, and so it gets to go into I see. Unicode. So the point that was made is that um, there are, uh, for example, there were some cell phone companies that put these in. And I know that that's true for some of the emoji characters. And um, because they now have, you know, oh, we have this standard set of characters. Let's get it added to Unicode. Um, it's funny that we can do that, but real languages like Klingon and Elvish don't get uh, <laughs> representations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's actually whether they are equal. It depends what you know the semantics of what they are trying to do. For example, if you try yes. to align the text, then they are not equal. But Absolutely. The meaning of the text. Yes, so the point was that um, you know, whether or not these two characters should compare equal you know, depends on your definition of equality. Um, and that's true, for, that's true absolutely for all of these, right? So, um, but as a counterexample, so the, the example that was made is if you're trying to draw text, you, know, you actually do care about the difference between these. And that's true for a lot of these. Like the ligature FI may be rendered by your text editor differently than you know, the character F followed by the character I. Um, on the other hand, uh, for example, if you're implementing a web browser and you want to implement search for it, and you type in FI, you want it to find you know, instances of FI and also instances of the ligature FI. Thank you. Um, so Unicode uh, defines two types of equivalence, basically. And these are uh, examples. The first one is an example of the first kind, and the second two are examples of the other kind. So the first kind are what are, what are called canonical equivalents. Um, so with canonical equivalents, they're strings where they should be, uh, for the purposes of text processing, not necessarily text rendering, um, they should be considered completely equivalent. They're you know, the same thing. Any, any place that you use one, it should, be, it should mean the same thing as the other. Um, and then it has what's called compatibility equivalents. Um, so, and these are places where, for example, when you're doing searching, maybe you want to consider these equivalences, um, but they don't necessarily need to be considered exactly the same in all contexts. And so in order to do comparisons, Unicode has what are called normalization forms. And so there's four normalization forms, NFC, NFD, NFKC, and NFKD. Uh, the NF is, it stands for normalization form. Um, the C ones uh, are composed forms. So basically anywhere that it finds, like for example, the, um, if it found the A followed by the, the combining diaries, um, it would combine those into the, the, uh, the precomposed form. Uh, the decomposed normalizations, on the other hand, do the opposite. If they come across precomposed forms, they will decompose them. Um, and then the difference between the canonical and the compatibility decomposed is that the canonical, you know, again, are the things that these things should always compare equal. Um, 
and the compatibility are largely for, okay, you're doing searching, you're, you're doing comparisons uh, of strings. Um, and normalization in all of these cases includes a well-defined ordering for combining marks. So if you, for example, uh, have a string that has combining marks in a different order, it will put them into the canonical order if there are multiple valid orderings. So let's look at how we can do normalization using the C++ standard library. You can't. <laughs> So, if equality is problematic, what about just sorting text? So we can take you know, a simple example. If we've got the string containing the, the Latin letter A and the string containing the Latin letter B, you know, we can just compare them by comparing the, the two code units. And you know, if we have Unicode strings, you know, we can do the same thing. But again, this is, this is a comparison of the representations. It's not a comparison of, oh, you know, are these, you know, should this one actually you know, appear before another? So, you know, as an example of this, even just with the ASCII characters, so let's say we have a, a vector of strings, and in it we've got um, the lowercase Latin letters C, B, and A, and then the uppercase Latin letters X, Y, and Z, and we call std sort to alphabetize the strings, and we print them out. What is, what gets printed? Lowercase and uppercase. Right. Yes. So it's not going to alphabetize them. It's actually going to print all of the uppercase letters first and then all of the lowercase letters because, again, it's comparing them by their code point value. And so all of the uppercase letters have code points that appear before um, the lowercase letters in ASCII. So what we actually need to do in order to get an alphabetization uh, is we need to use uh, some locale because alphabetization uh, or, and collation um, is, is fundamentally locale sensitive. It's, it's particular to each language. Um, so for example here, if we, if we uh, instantiate the, or if we create the, uh, the English locale for the United States and sort these, then we'll get them in the expected you know, alphabetical order. But the reason that these um, you know, are different for different um, languages. So we can consider, for example, the, the A with diarises. Um, in the German locale, it's considered to be just an A with, a, with an accent, so it gets sorted after the A's. But in the Swedish language, um, it's actually considered its own letter, and it gets sorted after the Z. So if you want to sort strings, you know, or if you want to collate strings, um, you actually have to know like, what locale you're working in. So we can look at how we do Unicode collation using the standard library. And that's also left blank. Now, so the standard library does have the std locale objects, and you can instantiate them. Uh, but like the, the actual locale strings, the locales supported by the environment, are entirely implementation defined. Uh, so for example, on Windows, there are no UTF-8 locale support. Um, on Linux uh, and other operating systems, you may be able to get a UTF-8 locale. Um, but what it actually gives you for you know, ordering, it, it may not entirely match what, what you're expecting. So if we look at a couple other text operations, you know, we, we mentioned that um, you know, some of the, the standard library functions just don't work well with Unicode. So as an example of this, you know, we have this two upper function that takes a code unit and converts it to you know, the equivalent uppercase code unit. But this expects that you know, there's actually an uppercase form of, of each of the lowercase letters. And so as a counterexample in German, there's, I believe it's called the SZ. Uh, the sharp, sharp S, okay. Um, the uppercase form is actually two characters. It's, it's two uppercase letter S's. Um, so this, you know, this uh, API, this two upper that returns uh, you know, a single character, it, it's not, not even reasonable. Yes? So I've heard there's uh, an effort to make an uppercase sharp S code point which should be rendered as a double S, but which will so I, I, you to go too lower, too upper, and, yep. and reverse it. So the point was uh, that there has been an effort to add an uppercase uh, um, sharp S um, code point, and that has happened. I, I know it's in Unicode. My understanding is that there's very few systems that use it. Now, I'll also note that there's some systems that don't, um, that you know, even if you have you know, good Unicode handling, they will not do the correct conversion for this, uh, this character. Um, for example, on Windows, we don't do it largely because it, it became a concern for, um, like even if you have a full string, it became a concern that people, uh, are, developers are not going to expect that, oh, I'm just doing a two-upper, now my string is longer. I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing, but... Um, so even the classification functions are unusable, right? So if you want to know that something is a space and you know, you're, you have a code unit of a care, um, the only way that these will work is with care 32 t so one thing that is actually fairly easy with um, 
the C++ standard library is you can convert between different encodings. So for example, here we convert from uh, a UTF-8 string to a UTF-32 string uh, simply by using um, the, the W string converter. Yeah? Uh, I'll assert that because that works at the string level rather than the iterator level, that in fact it's pretty, even that's pretty badly limited. Okay, uh, Beeman made the point that because this works at the string level and not the iterator level, it, it's fairly limited. Um, similarly, you can do something, uh, you can actually do uh, transformations using the IO streams by imbuing you know, a custom locale with, with a code conversion facet. So for example, this program, um, I write out binary data, which happens to be uh, UTF-8 data. Um, you'll see I include the, uh, I include the byte order mark. This is the UTF-8 byte order mark, and then a set of, a sequence of UTF-8 data. Um, in our, uh, in our code CVT facet, um, we tell it to consume the header, which means that it will look for a byte order mark and it will do the right thing, you know, based on what byte order mark is there. Now you still need to tell it what the, you know, what you think the source encoding is. Um, and then this program prints out um, this, you know, the, the sequence of, of code points that it's read uh, because we're converting to UTF-32. Um, I actually was somewhat surprised. There are no, um, so there are type, de uh, there are type defs for, um, uh, care and WCareT uh, stream types, but there's none for the Care 16 or Care 32 uh, types. Yes. I also wonder how well those are supported. Well, the, the, the Care and the White Care types usually have are pre-specialized in, in the in whatever shared object or DLL. Yep. Standard library comes in. I don't know if the Care 16 and Care 32 versions are. That. Uh, Yes, that may be. Um, so the point was that um, the care and WCareT uh, specializations may actually be pre-specialized and, and be part of your standard library implementation with custom implementations, um, and that you know these uh, these other two may not be uh, for Care 16 and Care 32T. Um, yeah, I don't actually know uh, what the requirements are there. Uh, I know that this worked on um, uh, Visual C++, which was the only implementation I was able to try it on, as libstud C++, uh, Lib C++ doesn't support uh, the code CBT header yet. Yes. Right. Uh, so the point was that, um, you know, in general, when you're talking with the outside world, you're going to be reading in, you know, individual bytes. So you want byte ordered I/O, uh, and then so that that's why there may not be these specializations. Uh, but in this case, um, the the get function on the stream to get the next character, the next, you know, character type thing, um, takes whatever the um, the uh, template parameter was, and, and that's the type of thing that it extracts. So the standard library doesn't have a whole lot, um, but there's a pair of libraries that we'll look at that um, actually make it, enable you to work with Unicode. So the first of these is uh, International Components for Unicode, or ICU. Um, so it's a library, it's got a huge set of features. It, it, if, it, if it doesn't have what you need, I would be surprised that, you know, I, I would be shocked. I was you know, trying to just read through the documentation and it's got all sorts of stuff. Um, it's very widely used, so it's well tested in a lot of real world software. Um, it runs on lots of platforms. It has a, pr a permissive license. Uh, it's MI MIT licensed, I think. Um, unfortunately, it has its own string type, uh, Unicode string, and it uses UTF-16. And the reason for that it uses UTF-16 is that the library was uh, originally written in Java. Uh, and then it was ported to C++, uh, so it, j because Java uses a 16-bit uh, character type, they used it here as well. Um, it doesn't work well with other string types in most contexts. Usually you actually have to convert uh, back and forth between the string types. Um, and the library is absolutely not modern C++ by any definition of that term. Again, largely because it was you know, a fairly direct port from Java, so the interfaces match uh, what is done in Java in many cases. So we'll take a look at, at just a few of its features that try to address some of these problems that we've looked at so far. Um, so first, it, it does have a, a UTF-32 code unit type, um, and it works uh, largely just like UCARE32T, or CARE32T. Um, 
with the exception that because it, it may not be a character type, you may need to you know have a cast to you know initialize it. Um, it also has a uCare type, which is the the UTF-16 code unit, um, and it needs uh, and it uses this because again the the Unicode string is fundamentally a 16-bit type uh, encoding. So the Unicode string. Um, can actually do the conversion from uh, UTF-32 or UTF-8, as we can see down here. Uh, it can also be initialized directly from a single UTF-32 character, in which case it just becomes a string containing that one character, uh, or from a single UTF-16 character. It has a ton of operations that actually work well with Unicode. So whereas when we saw um, the, uh, the std string interface, like a lot of the functions, they operate on code units, so they're not very useful for actually working with Unicode text. Um, the Unicode string functions, like they, they actually are designed um, to work with Unicode text. And one of the key things here is that anywhere that you have something that uh, returns you a character, or um, for example, if you want to append a character, it doesn't take a, a uCare, which is a 16-bit thing. It takes a, a uCare 32, it, so you can pass the entire code point, and you know, it does all of, the, all of the conversion automatically internally. So it has support for normalization. Um, so here's an example of, uh, you know, we, we normalize uh, this string, which starts off as a Latin capital letter A with a combining diaries, and then we, um, uh, we normalize it according to the, um, uh, the composed normalization form. And that gives us back a string containing just the, com the pre-composed character, the Latin capital letter A with diaries. You can also do collation. Uh, it can create col uh, uh, collators for each locale. Um, it returns a pointer, so you know you can use unique putter to handle uh, ownership. It also has Unicode regular expressions, so I didn't even mention uh, the C++ standard library regular expressions, which uh, basically, if you want to use them for Unicode, um, first, if you want to do anything useful, you're probably going to need to use uh, UTF-32 strings because you know it's not going to handle the UTF-8 encoding internally. Um, Second, it doesn't actually handle, there's a whole bunch of uh, Unicode-specific regular expression features. So for example, here um, we want to match any character that has the property, it's a number. And then we try to match it with this string that contains 12 and 5 eighths using the, the Roman numeral character and the, uh, the fraction 5 over 8. Uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll process the matches and, and this will match both of those. So these interfaces, like, like I said, they're not modern C++. They're kind of cumbersome to work with. Uh, they don't interop well with standard library stuff. Um, so for most basic tasks, you don't actually need to use um, ICU. Uh, there's a library in Boost, Boost Locale. Um, it was introduced in, in Boost 148. And um, it's basically a modern C++ API. And it doesn't have all of the Unicode logic inside of it. Instead, it, us it uses another backend that provides all the, all the Unicode functionality. So for example, it can use ICU. Um, you have to build it with ICU support. Um, it can use the C++ standard library, which is you know limited to your platform's you know support for Unicode stuff, um, or it can use uh, the Windows API directly or the POSIX APIs for working with um, Unicode strings. So it doesn't have support for you know most of ICU, uh, but it has support for you know most of the commonly used features. Um, to start off with, um, usually you need to to create a locale. So here, for example. Uh, um, we create an English locale with, with uh, UT, uh, support for UTF-8. Um, the boost locale generator is basically like a, a container that, that stores the locales you've created because creating them is, is uh, very expensive. Um, so we can use this for normalization. So for example, here we have um, two strings. The first one is the pre-composed form of the Latin letter A with diaries, and the second one is the decomposed form. Um, and it just has a normalize function that takes the string, the locale, and then the normalization form that you want to use. And we can insert at the end that you know, we've actually done the, the transformation like we'd expect. Uh, it supports collation. Uh, so it has, um, actually, one thing I, I also wanted to mention on this previous slide. Um, so this, this is based on, on std locale. Uh, so you can actually use the std locale in, in various places where std locale is required. Um, and it adds support for Unicode. So for example, if you're running on Windows and you try to create a locale with enus.utf8, it's, it's going to crash because, or it's going to throw an exception actually, uh, because there is no such locale by, uh, that supports the utf8 character set. Um, so this handles that automatically. Um, so we can do collation. So for example here, um, you know, again we have the A and then the A with diaries, and um, you know, if we do uh, the comparison, uh, basically, um, 
we get the, fa the collator facet from the, uh, the locale, and then we call uh, compare on it. It also has a nice helper that um, will let you use this as, for example, uh, a, the ordering, uh, the comparer for a map. Uh, so, for example, here we um, we construct or we construct a set with this um, with this comparer. So it will actually you it'll actually handle Unicode equivalents and it'll do the correct collation when you stick things in the set. Um, this is most useful, uh, for example, if you if you're you know storing words in a language that has multiple representations, uh, and you want to make sure that you know you only have one copy of of each word. Um, it supports so Unicode actually has a set of uh, uh, collation uh, levels. Um, so the the first one, uh, the primary one, is that it ignores cases and accents, and it compares uh, base characters only. Uh, the secondary one ignores case, but it still considers accents. Uh, the, the tertiary one uh, considers case and accents. Um, you can find out more about this in the Unicode standard, which we'll talk about in a moment. So Boost Locale can do conversions. So you can convert um, you know, this UTF-8 string to UTF-16 or UTF-32. Uh, you can convert the UC, uh, UTF-16 string to UTF-32, or you can convert back to uh, UTF-8, which is implied by care. Um, Yes. Can you convert to and from other code pages? Yes. And that's actually what I've got on the next this next slide. <laughs> so I have thank you. So um, here we uh, we have the Cyrillic string that we had from before that says hello, and we're going to convert it to UTF-8 um, using the right ISO encoding. Um, so it also has a whole bunch of uh, functionality for uh, string-based uh, case manipulation, for example. So you can, uh, you know, call two upper on an entire string, which gives you the correct semantics you need, for example, to handle, you know, different numbers of characters. Um, it has boundary analysis. So here we construct a segment iterator, and we iterate over characters. Now I contend that this is misnamed um, because what this actually uh, iterates over are, are text elements. So it'll iterate, it'll, it'll find blocks of a character with all of its, a base character with all its combining characters. Um, so this usage of, of the word character doesn't match what's, you know, what the way that Unicode uses it. But basically the idea is here is that we're going to iterate over text elements. Um, so for example here, um, you can see that uh, the byte length of this string is eight because, again, it takes eight code units, UTF-8 code units to represent it. Um, but if we iterate over it using this this segment index uh, iterator, um, you know, we only get three, which is the number that we would expect: one for the one, one for the a, and then the diaries, the two character uh, characters together, and then one for the cocktail glass. Yes. Um, when you say that the, the a there is uh, or the, the a with the diaries is on is actually two. Uh, code points, doesn't that depend on how you actually save the files? Uh, pardon? Doesn't that depend on the encoding of the file? Um, so the question was uh, whether this uh, is the composed or the de or the uh, the precomposed or the decomposed form. You know, the one that takes just one character or two. Uh, doesn't that depend on the encoding of the file? Actually, um, yes. Um, and so when I did most of my testing, because Visual C++ doesn't yet support uh, Unicode literals, I actually had to put in the uh, Unicode uh, using the um, the universal character names, the backslash U followed by the uh, um, the thing. But yes, you're right. Uh, your text editor might save it, you know, in a different form than you typed it in. That's totally possible. Um, so Boost Regex can also use uh, sit on top of the ICU Regex engine. Um, so, for example, this is an example of doing regex matching uh, for the same thing we had with ICU. Uh, basically, it works just like you know with the regex token iterator, except you can use the U32 regex token iterator instead, um, and then it'll iterate over the the various matches. So we'll look at. There's two. Um, I was looking for, you know, okay. So the the standard library support is fairly poor. You know, what have what has been proposed for standardization? Um, and there were two proposals that I found. Um, one of them that uh, Beeman wrote uh, is uh, a proposal to adapt the standard library strings uh, to uh, support Unicode a little better, and, and specifically uh, to support different encodings. Um, so for example, uh, the, the paper proposes to add new constructors and, and new assignment operators to a basic string so that you can take a basic string with a different encoding and you know a, a initialize um, the string with it. So for example, you could have a U32 string and initialize a, a uh, std string from it and it would do the correct uh, conversions. Um, plus there were new overloads for the formatted I.O. operators and uh, new uh, encoding conversion iterators. 
Uh, the second paper was also interesting. Uh, it was proposed by Mark Boyle uh, uh, in December, I think the paper was put out. Um, and it proposes uh, a new string type because, you know, we should, of course, have a new string type. Uh, and the string type is called uh, encoded string. Um, it provides a slimmed down std string like interface. Um, and all of the operations are on code points, not on code units. So when you iterate over it, you know, even if um, you know, you're using UTF-8 where you may have four bytes, four code units representing a single code point, when you iterate over this string from begin to end, you'll just get the code points. Um, this has the distinct disadvantage that iterators are bidirectional only uh, because you can't have random access when you don't know how large each of the, the elements is. Um, so there's that. So I have a number of resources here that I, you know, recommend. Uh, the Unicode Explained book, it's an O'Reilly book. It was uh, interesting, fairly, you know, comprehensive and thorough. Um, the Unicode standard is surprisingly easy to read. Much easier, I have to say, than the C++ standard. Um, <laughs> and it has a set of, um, it's a set of annexes and, uh, and technical reports that go with it that are, um, they're very interesting. You know, they talk about a lot of the problems that people run into, they talk about, you know, a lot of issues, has an enormous uh, FAQ uh, that even has an FAQ about the FAQ. Uh, so um, there's a lot of information there. Uh, you can find the Boost Locale library. Uh, Boost No Wide is not a Boost library yet. I saw it's uh, in the review queue, but there's no um, uh, review manager or whatever. Um, and what this is, is it's basically a library uh, to make working with Visual C++ and, and Windows platforms a bit easier with, uh, uh, since, you know, most of Windows uses UTF-16, if you want to use UTF-8 and narrow strings in your uh, app, it, it can be difficult. So, for example, if you pass a narrow string to uh, fopen um, and it contains uh, UTF-8 characters, it's not going to do what you expect. You need to convert to wide characters and then use uh, we have a wfopen function instead. Uh, so he's got a library here that uh, re-implements some of those functions to make it a bit easier to work with. Um, there's this website, UTF-8 Everywhere, that's sort of like a manifesto written by a handful of people about why UTF-8 should be, you know, the encoding that is used, you know, everywhere, um, you know, with fallback to UTF-32 when you actually need the, you know, the one-to-one -one mapping between code points and, and character or and code units. Um, and there's a nice discussion on uh, on uh, one of the Stack Exchange sites of should UTF-16 be considered harmful. So, with all that said, are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. Can you go back to any one of your slides that has a UTF-8 literal? There was somewhere towards the end. Yes. Yeah. So, this gentleman up here asked a question about uh, your editor, which is very valid because you're you're typing in something and the same encoding process is happening. When your source file gets uh, saved, then the compiler reads it in. So, first of all, does this standard say anything about what the encoding of source files are? So the question is, does the standard say anything about the encoding of source files? Um, it mandates that there is a um, a basic execution character set, which basically is, you know, a selection of the ASCII characters required to represent all of the C++ things. Um, and at compile time, you have to support all of those. I don't actually think that it requires that the compiler handle Unicode text, you know, as input. And that's why, uh, for example, we have the uh, the um, universal character name literals, the backslash u with the text. Did you? Yeah. Um, I have a proposal in front of the core group that um, the standard continue to support source encode any source encoding they want to, but that they always support UTF-8. Okay. So and because, and there are two reasons for that is why that specific thing is proposed. One is because UTF-8 is a wonderful standard to propose for that use. The other is all compilers that we could quickly get any information on already supported UTF-8. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of an issue of with or without byte order marker, but right. you know, that, that's something the core group could work out. And, I, and I'd like to reactivate that, that proposal and, and push that out, because right now you cannot write a C++ program and ensure that it's portable to any compiler, because the compiler may simply not write read the character set that you wrote the program. Yep. 
Uh, so Beeman's point was that um, he has a proposal before the core language group that um, to basically continue permitting compilers to support any character encoding that they like, but also to, to require that they support UTF-8, both because you know it's a it's a useful encoding, but also because at least today there's no there's basically no way to write portable C++ source code because your code is is dependent on some encoding, and you know what uh, your compiler supports is not standard. So, yes. So I have a question. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned like that uh, UTF-4 32 is basically one-to-one -one code point with code units. Yes. Like, uh, and uh, UTF-8 can be up to four right now, right? Yes. So my my question is like, once the Unicode raised to the point where the 32 is not enough, like <laughs> how far? Uh, like, wh why should why should you consider Char 32 as uh, one to one, and uh, how far UTF-8 can go? Like, is there still availability in the UTF-8 where we can extend it to encode more than four? Yeah. So the question was, um, uh, you know, what happens when you know the no, you know basically four billion characters is not enough. But actually, we don't have four billion. We only have you know 1.1 million due to the UTF-16 uh, encoding rules. Um, so. Yes, on the one hand, like I don't want to, you know, be like Unicode 1.0 was, where they were like, oh yeah, 65,000 ought to be enough for anybody, you know. I'd, uh, right, right, yeah. Um, like I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say that. But on the other hand, 1.1 million characters is a lot, and we're only using 10% of it about at this point in time. Well, well, now, these people put in like uh, rabbits. There. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there. If we had, if we had a, uh, if we had a, a character for every animal out there, then yes, we might, we might run out. Um, <laughs> So, it, it turned actually. So when UTF-8 was originally standardized, um, it, it supported um, it supported up to six code units. So you could actually represent much more than just the 1.1 million. Uh, they restricted it when they when they decided, oh, we need support with uh, we need to support this UTF-16 thing. So let's you know restrict it to so that you can encode the same code space in each encoding form. Um, so from that respect, it's it's artificially restricted. Um, you know, at some point, if they decided, okay, you know, we're throwing UTF-16 out the window, then um, you know, in theory, you could just expand the UTF-8 encoding to support you know uh, up to six or or more code units. I think six is the practical limit because um, the number of you know you you have to be able to encode the number of trail bytes in your lead byte. Um, Yes. You could just let the encoding go into, you know, let the lead byte introduce the next lead byte. <laughs> that yes. So there's, so there are there are a lot of options, but uh, so the, the suggestion was, oh, you could just have the one lead byte introduce the next lead byte. Um, that is certainly, I mean, there's certainly options. I think that, uh, I think that any speculation here, like, I, I don't think this is a short-term problem, or even, you know, a, like, I hope that we don't run into this problem before I retire. So we'll let we'll let our children deal with it. <laughs> yes. I'd like to make a comment, and that is that the reason that C++ standard libraries does not have good support for Unicode is not because of a lack of interest on the committee's part or a lack of realization that it would be wonderful to have such support. It's because no one has stepped forward with viable proposals. Yes. So Beeman has said that, you know, it's not that the Standards Committee is not interested in Un Unicode support, and I'm pretty sure that everyone on the Standards Committee would love to have good Unicode support, um, but uh, it's that nobody has submitted viable proposals uh, at this point. So, so write a paper. So, yes. How about the font sign? I mean, when you're going to represent 100,000 different characters, it's a big hassle to draw all those pictures. Uh, is there like a default set of images that you could use as a font provider and only make the interesting characters your own style, or how does it work? Uh, so the question is, you know, what do we do with um, with actually rendering all of these characters? So if there's 1.1 you know, million possible characters, and there's only 100,000 now, but even that's a lot, you know, if you go and create a new font, you know, do you have to go and create glyphs for each of these? Um, so there's two things. The Unicode standard has sort of like you know a an example representation of uh, you know each glyph. It's there for you know exp you know exposition only. It's not you know this is the only way to, to draw it. Um, I know that I, I don't know how it works on other systems. I know that on Windows uh, it uses fall it'll use fallbacks if it can. Uh, some software will. Um, so for example, if you're you know typing in, in some font that doesn't support a character, it might fall back to uh, one of the symbol fonts uh, that's available or one of the you know more complete Unicode fonts. Um, 
but otherwise, you know, like maybe if you're typing along, you'll just get the box like I had in the at, on the as a joke at the beginning. Um, so, does that answer? I'd like to interrupt you. you yes. Can I ask more questions. About the road. Okay. Before people start to leave, um, Maddie has set out leftovers from last night. She's got some fresh vegetables and stuff, but um, but the the chicken and I think there's still some hair that left from last night. It's down where we had the picnic last night. So. If you don't want to go into town, there's not enough for everybody. But, uh, but if you want to avoid the trip in town, you don't want leftovers, that's an option. Excellent. OK, so I've reached the end of the presentation. We've reached the null terminator. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk later.